Welcome back. Let's talk scraping today. Um, I want to start at basics this time. I've shown scraping a few times in the past on my channel, but um, in the comments there always pop up some questions that I want to address in this video and also I wanted to show um, the minimal basics of scraping. So let, let's, let, let's begin. What is scraping? Scraping is basically a way to create a flat surface with hand tools. Just like filing or chiseling or even sawing by hand, scraping is a chip removing process with the goal of creating a true flat surface. Why are we scraping? Um, there are a few reasons. One, the part doesn't fit on a machine tool. If, you, if you're working on a big machine part and you cannot fit it on a bigger machine to, to get surfaces flat, you have to rely on scraping. Um, also, a scraped surface is generally, if done right, really flat. Surface grinding is pretty darn good, but scraping can be better. Surface grinding can be better than scraping. It always depends a little bit on who does what. But generally scraping produces a dead flat surface if done right. There are two kinds of surfaces you want to scrape. One are sliding surfaces like um, machine ways. On those the scraping is beneficial because the scraping isn't, gives not a uniform even surface, it creates a pattern of high and low areas and that's beneficial to carry the oil between the two sliding surfaces, um, which prevents galling and premature wear. On the other hand, there are surfaces that you scrape because you have no other way to create a flat surface. Maybe for a, let's say an angle plate, let's say this angle plate here. You could surface grind this if you had a surface grinder big enough, but I don't have. So I machined it and then I scraped it. On those parts you don't want um, heavy deep wellies for, um, for oil because they're not sliding parts. You just want the part to be flat. So. This shows an ideally surface ground part, which is perfectly flat. And this part is a scraped part. All from side view, of course. Um, imagine those two parts moving against each other. Um, these points up here are the points contacting between both of the parts and those carry all the load. So the load spreads out over all these points and the area between, between the high spots, which is low, there is space for oil. So you have uncountable number of small wellies that have space to carry the oil when the two parts move against each other because on the high spots where the parts touch each other there is no space for oil it will get uh, scraped off and moved out by the by the two parts rubbing against each other so um, that's very beneficial in um, in modern CNC machines with box ways you find this often you have one side hardened and ground and the other side is scraped. But hey, couldn't you just surface grind both parts and let them run against each other? Yes, you could, and it is done. But the problem is, um, as you have a, a incredible high um, area of contact between the two parts, the oil film gets very thin over time, if you don't have a pressure loop system, 
and eventually gets even pushed out completely. And then the surfaces wear and gall. So they they score up the surfaces. Imagine two gauge blocks. These are standard gauge blocks of course and they have a, a very good surface finish. And when you rub them together it should stick. And if you rub them long enough they will gall between each other and tear up the surface. So and you have also this when you move them against each other this um what do you call it stick slip effect. They stick together until you overcome the friction and then they move. Stick slip it's called. Um, that's a real problem on CNC machines with slideways or even a manual machine with slideways. Um, so ground against ground it can be done but you have to take precautions like uh, machining in uh, oil grooves, proper oil grooves, proper designed ones. What do we need for scraping? That's easy, just about a thousand bucks worth in tools. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Uh, you can start out pretty basic. Okay, what do we need? Let's let's go over these. There are some advanced tools in the selection, some that you need in the beginning. So the most basic thing you need is a scraper. I will go in detail on that later. You need a way to sharpen it, preferably a diamond wheel. There are other ways you could use a diamond file, diamond stones, or even a green carbide wheel, a silicon carbide wheel for your bench grinder, but those are pretty awful. So try to get a, a very fine grit diamond wheel and mount it on a bench grinder like this. I will show, this is my ghetto carbide grinder, I will show that later. Then you need some, some high spot blue. Um, either the old oil-based uh, Prussian blue or Dichem or this is uh, the diamond brand. The oil-based stuff is a horrible mess. Uh, you, at the end of the day you look, look like a smurf. Or you get the water-soluble canode uh, blue and preferable if you can get it uh, the yellow too. You need um, a brayer is very useful. This is to spread out the paint on your master surface, for example surface plate. You need stones for deburring, a uh, medium grit India stone like this one works quite well. This is all this is this is the stone that Richard King hands out at his glasses. Um, it works quite well and I happen to like a fine aluminum oxide stone that I surface ground on one side perfectly flat. This works for finishing uh, very good. This is a piece of plate glass. I use this to spread out the paint because my surface plate is not as big. Um, and I'm in the, in the lucky position to have a power scraper. This is a Rents power scraper and of course there is the well-known Biax um, power scraper. This makes work so much faster. It's point and shoot. With this you have to do all the work yourself. With this you just aim and let the machine remove the material. And you need a master surface. Uh, a surface plate. You can get a cast iron surface plate or, which I think is preferable, a granite. This is a, a Chinese import grade zero zero, and it's quite good. You can get, you can, for example, buy an old coordinate measuring machine on eBay with a granite table and strip the machine down and just keep the table. This will make you end up with a <laughs> with a rather cheap and very big surface plate. You can buy the, the Chinese ones, which are reasonable cheap and quite okay, or you can buy something like a, a plano lead from Germany or a Standridge granite or Sterrett granite surface plate. There are all, uh, there are really a lot of manufacturers that make um, hardstone surface plate and inspection equipment. 
so you need that too. And of course, if you want to do machine ways like dovetails or prismatic ways, you need a straight edge, perfectly straight and flat straight edge. You can make them yourself out of cast iron, scrape them, and then you're good to go. Okay, let's talk about the most basic tool, the hand scraper. Um, this is ShopMade. Uh, it's modeled after the Biax hand scraper. It takes a it takes a carbide blade in the front, which which is clamped by by this upper piece and uh, and this four millimeter screw here, just like this. The scraper itself has a, a step cut in it where the blade can rest and the clamping piece is relieved in the center and has a pad in front and back so it it actually clamps the, the carbide blade. You can buy the carbide blades for example from Biax or Sandvik and this scraper is end of the blade to end of the handle 470 millimeters long that's for me that's a, a good size I can work this, with this quite well there is also a pad that I can screw on the end when I want to push with my with the belly <laughs> or with my body this is just a rubber pad from an angle grinder for uh, sand, sanding wheels um, and I tapped, I drilled and tapped the end of the handle of the scraper for an M8 screw and screws directly into the wood. Um, so this is a rather basic scraper and you don't want to make the this portion here too stiff otherwise uh, it tends to chatter and doesn't work as well. Um, this one is 4 millimeter thick and 20 millimeter wide and it's it's quite flexible that's what you want you want don't want to make it any thicker like Sandwick sells a scraper too but it's something like 30 millimeters wide and 5 millimeters thick and it's stiff like hell um, it really kills you when you have to use it quite some time. So that's basic hand scraper. Um, I did all the scraping on my lathe, for example, with this scraper. Um, back in the day before carbide was widely used, people used carbon steel or tool steel blades, hardened them and stoned them sharp. But they get dull so fast they work but you're pretty much sharpening all the time even the carbide needs a dress after a few passes scraping cast iron anyway so whatever you do try to get a carbide blade they are not cheap but uh, you can mickey mouse your way around it and buy for example a, a carbide planar blade which are rather cheap and use that, but the grade of carbide on those is not perfect for scraping. But there, you can also silver solder an old lathe insert, uh, an indexable insert to a piece of steel and sharpen that as a scraper. There are many ways to do it, but um, this is a, a hand scraper like this is a, a nice easy project for a rainy Sunday afternoon and you will have a tool that lasts you or you buy the Biax uh, hand scraper which looks pretty much like this <laughs> so for the geometry of the scraper blade if you look down on it like this they are ground with a radius um, a good general purpose radius is a 60 millimeter radius can do pretty pretty much most of your work with a 60 radius. You can do roughing kinda and you can do almost finishing with it. 
and when you look at the side of the blade like this you want it to be five degree negative so if you turn this and this is this is the work you grind your tool negative five degrees um, this would be if, if we have a, a right angle in here this would be neutral uh, zero degree uh, cutting angle and if we have 95 degree in here this is five degree negative because we're beyond 90 degrees if you grind it like this this is positive um, for example if you grind it 85 degrees in here this is five degree positive this up here is five degree negative and this is zero degree neutral one important thing is the surface finish on the grind of these blades and as you can see this is ground on a 3000 grit uh, diamond wheel and surface finish is pretty darn good um, I, don't, I don't even do lapping or something like that to the scraper blades off the 3000 grit uh, diamond wheel it's, it's perfectly good enough um, and as you can see it's ground 5 degree negative like this the other side is has is uh, ground to five degree negative two times so it makes it's like a roof shape it's uh, like this and I do that or pretty much everybody does this so they have two cutting edges when one side gets still dull flip it around and you can go on before you have to go to the grinder you can even do this to all four sides of the scraper blade then you have uh, um, eight cutting edges before you have to go back to the grinder as you can see I also hit flat surface here against the grinding wheel and I will show that later um, until I get a mirror finish up to the cutting edge this improves uh, surface quality on the scraping and decreases chatter so that's the surface finish you're looking for roughly there is one little tool I didn't show um, this is a, a radius gauge it has a this is laser cut out of uh, stainless steel it has a 40 60 90 and 115 millimeter radius on it and you use it to check your grind just like this and in between in here this is uh, 25.4 by 25.4 millimeters so uh, <laughs> one inch by one inch you use this for checking your uh, the quality of your scraped surface I can show that later too how is it done I'm glad you asked I will show you okay let's do some actual scraping let's say we have this random block of cast iron and we want to make it flat on this surface obviously somebody had already a go at it and we don't know anything about it yet only that a hack already scraped around on it so in order to check the flatness we need to break up the surface otherwise it would just stick to the surface plate and be a blatant mess so we take our scraper with a 60 radius blade and we just go at it. We just scrape once over the whole surface to break it up. And when you do that you want to make actual chips you don't want like this you really want to lean into it and 
you want to take a proper proper chip so you produce actually a small scraped welly So you see that I went roughly 45 degrees across the surface and we do that because we will alternate now 90 degrees to it and go 45 the other direction otherwise if you don't alternate your direction you will get horrible chatter. The, the chatter you always get a little bit of chattering and when you don't alternate your direction, the chattering gets worse. Um, the, the scraper blade moves into the old chatter marks and makes them worse. So alternate your directions. So now we have surface scraped once over pretty much and we take our India stone medium, medium grit and we remove all the burrs from scraping. On each scraper pass on the end we create a very tiny burr and we need to remove that with the stone before we go to the surface plate. Uh, there are techniques that eliminate the, the burr at the end like um, pulling out at the end like this. This leaves basically no burr but it's very it, it takes a lot of practice and it's a little bit slower. Now we want to take this over to the surface plate and check it for flatness before we go on. Otherwise we're just scratching up the surface and we have no clue what we're doing. So we're over at the surface plate and I have some uh, uh, glass cleaner here and I like to use that for the surface plate to prepare it. Then we have our blue canode, um, high spot blue, water soluble, and we just get a, a small dab of it on the surface plate. You don't need much of it. Then you take a brayer or a foam roller or something like that and you spread it out in one space. Somewhat even. That almost feels a bit too much. Then you roll out the surface where you want. This is just the paint spreading area. You, you spread out a bit of paint, roll it out, get your brayer coated with the color too. Then you want to prepare the actual surface that you're working on. Just try to get a, an even coat of the blue on it. After that you take your workpiece and you rub it on the, on the paint. And you transfer the blue from the surface plate to the high spots of your part. It feels a bit... I'm adding a little bit more of the bluing. It feels a bit faint for roughing. And you always want to make sure that your part is clean, you don't get dust into the surface or something like that. Now you rub it. And an important thing is to hinge the part if possible. You take one end of the part and swing it around a little bit and you 
you try to find the a spot around which the part rotates and it looks like it's about here so that means we have the part is high here and it looks like here so these are two high spots you can also identify them with with a, a plastic faced hammer uh, we identified this and this corner as high can you hear the difference? On the high spots it sounds more solid and when we flip it around and we look at the bluing when we look at the bluing now we have high spot here and high spot here and we get blue here in this area and down here in this area but we also get blue here and here and that's dangerous um, we don't know if this is a, a real actual reading because the part could have tipped over the axis between the two high spots that means it rocks back and forth so uh, we ignore this and this for right now and concentrate on the corners here just like this we're only going to scrape these corners here until the hinge the hinging point moves in about here and here um, rule of thumb is 33% uh, of the overall length to the inside and centered you want to have your hinge point on both sides then you can be pretty sure that your part is flat there are other ways to check it um, for example with a large knife edge straight edge against light or with an indicator and check if the part is weeble wobbling on the surface plate but the hinging is actually a very fast way and um, I was surprised how how accurate it is um, before the class with Richard King I didn't know or I read about the hinging but I didn't give it any consideration I was thinking that it's optional but it's not you have to do something to check if your part is actually bowed and then you have to confirm if your blue your area your you have your high spots is actually a real high spot or or the just part just tipped over in an extreme case you could have a part that's like this it's super uh, super convex and when you take your pre your bluing when you rub it on the surface plate you could get um, bearing points all over the surface because it's rocking back and forth like a, a rocking chair but it's not flattened in any way and that can cause you to chase your tail for hours and hours will drive you completely nuts so do do something to find to identify where the part is uh, high actually not only by rubbing but with a second method like hinging it so we're just going to scrape these two areas now <laughs> At this point you don't care about the appearance of your scraping at all you just want to get material off and you want to get the part very roughly flattened when you get to the edge to, to the edge that faces towards you um, you have to be really careful otherwise you you 
catch the edge and tear up the surface. Um, either you're super careful, which means you're lazy, or you take your part and actually flip it around, which is the safer method, of course. And then you go the edge like this. And I prefer to use a shop vac to remove the, the cast iron dust or chips. When you use compressed air, you will end up with these small carbide, uh, with these small cast iron needles everywhere in the shop.